Hi, in a previous video, which I'll link in down below an unboxing and first impressions of this O1 XDS 3202A 14-bit oscilloscope. Now, this is a bit of an unusual beast because it's got a 14-bit high-resolution converter, which is what we want to look at. In fact, it's got a 14-bit, 12-bit, and 8-bit converter in there, which take a look. Arbitrary waveform generator. It is not a mixed signal uh, scope, but it's got touchscreen. It's got Wi-Fi. It's not particularly fast. Uh, 200 meg bandwidth with one gig sample per second. Uh, that sample rate will drop with the number of bits, up to 14 bits, I believe it drops down to like 125 meg sample per second. It's got an arbitrary waveform generator, but it's got like uh, DCAN, I2C, RS-232, SPI decoding, touch screen, touchscreen, VGA, Wi-Fi. It's got an app which you can scan in, and it's got a multimeter, as well. Uh, it's got an app which you can scan in, and it's got a multimeter as well built in and it's like 1200 bucks so it's it's not exactly an entry level uh price point so it's in a rather niche market segment where really the only reason that you'd buy this is because of the 14-bit high-resolution res converter. You might have seen in my 1,000th video I did a comparison of uh, for like 11 different scopes that I've got here in the lab. And this one performed really well, as you'd kind of expect, like down in the noise and uh, stuff like that. So haven't done full evaluation on it. But anyway, it, it did, a, you know, had a, did a respectable job, as you'd expect from something that has a, a 12 or 14 bit converter in it. So anyway, let's tear this thing apart and see what's inside, shall we? And just a, a quick overview. It's like, you know, reasonable tilting feet on there. The thing, it doesn't weigh a huge amount and it's really, really thin. Look at that and a weird, uh, you know, concave sort of uh, aspect to the back there. So kind of weird. Let's take out a few screws and whip it apart. Hmm. Now there has been some speculation about this thing that it wouldn't use a true 14-bit converter in there or even a uh, true 12-bit uh, um, and that it's just doing oversampling. Well, I'm almost 100% sure that's not the case and it is using a real 14-bit uh, converter in there. In fact, the converter, I believe, is an 8-bit, 12-bit, and 14-bit converter combo because there's a Hittite part. It's the, uh, what is it, the HMCAD 1520, and it uh, matches the, not only is it a combined uh, ADC like that, up to 8, 12, and 14-bit, but it matches the sample rate of this thing in the different modes precisely. So I believe that's what it's actually uh, using. So I'd be stunned if it's not that Hittite uh, part, unless there's some other uh, manufacturer of some compatible part. So anyway, can we, oh, there we go. That's our battery compartment, of course. Forgot all about that. That, of course, might be handy if you're uh, using this in the field to do, a, you know, high resolution uh, logging of something like that. But, you know, probably if you're doing that sort of thing, you'd probably use a dedicated data logger. But if you needed a high resolution scope with battery, this is probably the only one on the market, I think. Anyway, stand to be corrected, but yeah, um, it'll definitely have a niche there. All right, let's lift this puppy out. It should, yep, woohoo! There we go. That's reasonably neat and tidy. See a bit of a how you doing cap just lying on its side like that. I guess they needed uh, some extra capacitance there. But let's take a squiz. So we've got clearly all single board uh, construction here. Just this. Uh, one main PCB, which does the front end as well. The cans, they might be... Oh, no, no, I think we can lift off the uh, cans. They've got some shielding over the uh, top part of that. Oh, no, that's no, that's heat sinking. You can see the uh, little heat sink divots on there. So they're obviously going to the uh, ADC and probably the um, uh, FPGA for the uh, main acquisition and everything else and the display and, and the main application uh, process. No, the application process is down here by the looks of it. Um, so, yeah, likely uh, ADC, memory and... Uh, uh, the um, acquisition FPGA, separate power supply and multimeter board. No, just the multimeter board. Um, yeah, there's our little Wi-Fi module. Yeah, 
And this thing, I think, has the tiniest power supply I've ever seen in a scope. Here it is here. We'll have a, a closer look. But basically, um, this thing mustn't draw much power at all because the battery, it can be battery powered, of course. So um, I'm curious to see how much power this thing draws. Let's have a look. 300 milliwatts in standby. That's awesome. VA is going to be higher, of course. There we go. 3.7 VA. But that's nice. Now let's switch it on. Yeah, that's not too bad. Around about 20 watts. Uh and 31 VA, so 20 watts isn't too shabby, I guess. It's, I think it's probably one of the lowest power ones I've seen, and that's in 14-bit mode. In 8-bit mode, it's basically the same. It makes no difference. If we have a look at the output caps on this thing, Y-min or Shishwamin quality is our life. Yeah. And there's just some other no-name uh, manufacturer there on the uh, primary side caps. And there's basically bugger all on this thing. I mean, it's only a single rail, though, which is why it's a lot smaller than the others. You can actually see 5.5 volts DC at uh, 5 amps output. So basically, uh, 25 watt uh, capable. It's drawing 20 watts. So yeah, okay. No worries. Um, Cute little power supply. It's okay. Um, uh, you know, no name caps, but that's par for the uh, course. So it all looks fairly reasonable for the uh, price point, but you know, there's no input uh, fuse in. If they just put fuse, no, they just put a link where the fuse is supposed to be. Um, but we have one thermistor, and that's basically it. There's no uh, poly protection or anything like that, but we've got ourselves uh, exposed mains wire in here, but that's all completely covered with the case. Earth going over to the main point, which goes down over to the main through the Wi-Fi board, all the way through to the main plate down here, which is the plate which uh, bolts in to the B and C. So that's all quite uh, reasonable. Interestingly, look, they've got a wire. They've got some uh, foil tape on the back side of the mains connector and a wire running off. You can bet your bottom dollar. Yeah, where is that? That's running over to... Oh, that's our antenna. Is that our mains antenna? That's our Wi-Fi antenna. That's our Wi-Fi antenna. What? <laughs> okay. Um, that's a bit how you're doing, isn't it? To slap it on the side of the mains connector. Oh, goodness. I don't know what effect that's going to have on the performance, but it's pretty terrible, Muriel. At first, I thought that was like the uh, 50 hertz, uh, like the mains frequency uh, pickup. Like I thought they were just using like a capacitive plate and then picking up the 50 hertz that way. But nah, it's the antenna. That's hilarious. Now let's look at the multimeter PCB or effectively the lack thereof of multimeter. Um, it's a real basic implementation with very little input protection at all. This uh, thing actually doesn't specify a cat rating on. It might in the manual. I'll look it up. If it is, I'll put it in. But it basically doesn't specify anything. Like this is, you know, like cat one, low cat two territory, like pretty, like it's not independently certified, nothing. Um, as you can see, like there's hardly anything here at all. So let's have a look at the voltage input over here. Oh, I've got a real fair income relay. Okay, thumbs up for the fair income relay. Um, <laughs> but we've only got one NTC thermistor here. We've got our two uh, high voltage input resistors here in the little MELF package. They have done the right thing. They've cut the uh, slots under there. So yeah, no worries. Okay, but that's basically uh, your only input uh, protection there. There are no MOV protection at all. We've got your traditional, which I did in my thousandth video. You've got your back-to-back uh, -back Zener uh, clamp with your two uh, transistors there. They've also cut the uh, uh, isolation slot underneath the relay as well. So that's quite nice. But there's basically bugger all. Uh, protection on this thing. That's basically it. Now, if we go over here to the amps range, here's our milliamp shunt here. There's no diode protection on that at all. And our 10 amp shunt here is just our regular nichrome uh, wire going across, which is meh. Okay, that's your stand, you know, it's a little bit how you're doing, but it does the job, right? You just trim it out, no worries. But there's basically none of your traditional diode bridge protection or anything like that. And there's certainly no fuse protection on this thing at all, let alone HRC fuses. We don't even have glass fuses. So, yeah, like you, you shouldn't even be using this on anything to do with the mains or anything, any high powered stuff at all. It's strictly 
you know, bench type measurement stuff. And this little tranny down here, that one's doing the uh, isolation. So it's just doing uh, power supply isolation to get an isolated power supply for the multimeter chipset, which is a pretty standard uh, Fortune uh, semiconductor part. You can go look that up. We might have some extra diode uh, clamping protection here and here. Uh, maybe that that's for the uh, maybe the current uh, ranges, but they're not going to protect like it's not even fused. I mean. Give me a break. That's a fail on the multimeter. Like, why do they even bother having multimeter in there? Urgh! Now, those keen viewers might have spotted that there's no fan in this thing. Oh, yes, there is. Where's the fan? Where's Wally? It's not under the case. No, sir, Bob. By the way, there's no side vents, which you'll see is, might be kind of important at the moment. Then there's only these uh, vents on the back of the concave part here. So where's the fan? Can you spot it? Can you spot it? Where's Wally? There's Wally, right under there. That's probably the worst implementa thermal implementation of a fan in an oscilloscope I've ever seen. That is awful. It's like, I believe it's sucking in this way and it's pushing down probably that way and under the board. And then where does the, where does the hot air have to go? It's got to spread over here. It's got to come up, dribble up the sides here and then out the vents here. Like on the, I, here, like it, Absolutely ridiculous. Ugh. Who did that? Stevie Wonder? By the way, they have done the right thing by having this uh, insulating sheet on the uh, multimeter and also on the uh, power supply as well. Fortunately, to get a good look at this, including getting the heatsink plate off, is that we've got to, I've got to undo the base plate here. The BNCs are tied into the base plate under there. So I've got to take the whole thing out, take off all that front uh, metalwork stuff, a bottom metalwork stuff, and then get to the bottom side of the screws here, because two of them are screwed from the bottom side, two are screwed from the top, so this is definitely a Stevie Wonder design, and, uh, like, uh, anyway, here we go. Uh, can we get out? Oh, yes! Yes! We're almost in like Flynn. Bloody hell, backlight. That's the LCD display for you display aficionados. I know you're out there. And is that the part number for the display? All the electrons are falling out. And what that thing was uh, originally designed for? I've got no idea. There it is on the uh, front of the unit, but it doesn't light up, doesn't do anything. So there's the front guts of the main unit, and you see they've got a separate board down here for the uh, times 10 Detection down here got a little ribbon cable going off. So that's all just part of the uh, keyboard matrixes and the rotary encoder matrix It's all just detecting that um, Not sure about the brand on these uh, Encoders though mm. uh, I'm not exactly sure what the LJV is it? I'm not sure what the marking is on that puppy if I find it I'll link it in there's the back side of the main board and we can go through it in detail and I'm sure we will but now I can uh, whack the heatsink off all right here we go oh we got some goop we won't be able to ah oh, okay there's no um just thermal pads good excellent don't have to goop it don't have to clean it up we can read that there's our FPGA. Now I was going to examine this board with the Tagano microscope as I would normally do, but unfortunately bloody Windows 10 installed some stupid update on my lab machine here and it's just killed it. Got the blue screen of death and it just simply keeps trying to repair itself, repair itself, and it doesn't bloody work. So, ah, uh, time for the macro lens. If you don't know what macro lens I use for most of my shots, um, except for the Tagano, I use an Optica uh, times 10 macro lens that just screws on the front of my camera, like this. If I can get the thread to light up. Yeah, it's really hard to get these numbers. You've got to get light at the right angle. I've got to shine my torch on it, but yes, I picked it. It's a HAD 1520. That's a Hittite part for 8 slash 12 slash 14 bit ADC. And you can see it is actually a true combined 8, 12, and 14-bit converter. It's got a precision mode, which uh, does 14-bit. It actually has a 16-bit data output, but it only claims to be a true 14-bit uh, converter. And four channels up to 105 meg samples per channel. So they've got two chips in here, so they're only using the one channel here. Interesting. 
and they're claiming actually uh, 11.8 effective number of bits at the 105 meg sample per, uh, per second in uh, presumably the 14 bit uh, mode. Or no, actually dual 8 bit output, is it? Right next to that is National Semiconductor LMX 2581, and that's the VCO, of course, that uh, generates the sample clock. And interestingly, check out this board here. They've actually got a daughter board for the oscillator. They've got a regular os larger oscillator footprint here, but they've decided to put a smaller one on there, mount, uh, you know, design this little daughter board and have that surface mounted on there with a little 5-pin SOT23. What is that, a little regulator? Or something like that. To, I, they might have had an issue with there with the stability of the oscillator or, or some such thing, perhaps. Hmm, interesting. And by the way, they do have actually one had 1520 per channel. So, yeah, that's not going to be cheap. And above the ADCs there, we've got a Spartan 6 FPGA. You can check out the number for those playing along at home. So that's the acquisition ASIC with the uh, memory either side of that thing. It looks like there would have uh, one chip per channel, I would be guessing. We'll just check out that part number there and put up the data sheet. But interestingly, above that, and coupled in to the main acquisition ASIC, they've got another Spartan 6 FPGA. Doesn't look as grunty, but that's obviously driving uh, the arbitrary waveform generator because we've got two Burr Brown DACs there. And then that goes over, we've got some more, some analog and some relay goodness there, and that BNC there would be the uh, output, would be the uh, arbitrary waveform generator outputs. And we've got a main application processor from, from TI, let's check that one out. And this is the Texas Instruments uh, Satara processor, one of these ARM Cortex A8 jobbies, and it's got everything that you could possibly want inside. It's about like less than 10 bucks in volume, but it's got the uh, LCD uh, controller which you want built in. It's got the touchscreen controller which you want built in and Ethernet and all the bells and whistles. So yeah, so they're running, I don't know what sort of OS they're running, maybe some flavor of Linux, who knows. Below that we've got some more Hynix memory and then what have we got? And then the VGA output there is handled by this Crontel part. I don't think I've seen one of these before, the 7026B. So there's the data sheet. Normally we've uh, seen it driven by the application processor directly or by a, um, some display uh, FPGA in the past, typically. So in this case, the VGA output didn't come for free. Like, it didn't come at just the cost of the VGA connector on the back and some and a couple of uh, passives. It, you know, came at the cost of yet another chip in the bomb. And as for the uh, fixed power input here, uh, as we saw before, it's actually 5.5 volts. I haven't actually measured it, but that's what it says on the power supply. So they're obviously allowing for like a diode uh, drop. So I don't see a big ass diode there to uh, bring in the battery. So they've obviously got some regulation stuff and that cap on its side, the Zund Zunder cap. Yeah, great. Um, is like just bodged on there. So like, I, they've got very little, uh, you know, bulk decoupling on this thing, actually. It's basically just the two caps on the power supply, plus this one, and that's pretty much it. There's a fair bit on the bottom, if I flip it over here, there you go. So here's the battery input contacts, and you can see that there's some, you know, battery charging uh, stuff probably, you know, uh, all integrated into this thing, and uh, there's probably a chipset that handles the... Uh, power supply switch over there. There's our ethernet port, and is that our ethernet chipset on the bottom? Can't quite see that one. And I won't bother taking off the uh, shield on the bottom, there's just gonna be a whole bunch of uh, passives under there, unless we want to reverse engineer the analog uh, front end, then yeah, it's not a huge deal. Um, because I have to, that's actually can solder down there. More relays on the bottom, a lot more passive uh, stuff around here, which is the, uh, uh, a DAC up here for the arbitrary uh, waveform generator. So they've gone to a lot of uh, bill of materials expense for the um, ARB gen output. I can't remember the uh, specs on that, but geez, there's a lot of stuff happening in there. And speaking of relays, there's like relays everywhere. The front end, four relays per front end, another relay over here, and uh, no less than five, six, seven, eight relays for the arbitrary waveform generator and the pass fail. Uh, trigger outputs, absolutely amazing.
but you know I'm a real life fanboy, and, and they are NEC ones, so yeah, but they just solved all their problems with relays, and there's nothing wrong with that. I like it. And we won't actually do a detailed analysis of the analog front end, but it looks like, you know, your typical modern uh, 200 meg analog front end, you know, you've got your programmable gain amp up here and just, you know, all your regular, uh, tran you know, discrete transistor stuff with some uh, relay switching and, you know, it's all pretty basic. There's going to be some extra stuff on the bottom. We've got our... Uh, Solid state relay down there, and yeah, it's pretty typical. If you want to reverse engineer it, go for it. So really, there's nothing hugely special on here apart from the had 15, 20, 14 bit uh, ADCs. You know, it's got a Spartan 6 like uh, FPGA for processing, like you know most other low end scopes do. It seems to be the uh, FPGA of choice. It's got an applications processor, which no nothing hugely special. It's got you know a basic 200 megahertz analog front end like you know, any other uh, Rigol or Siglent, uh, you know, four, sub $400 scope does, but this is a $1,200 scope. So you've got to wonder where all the money's going. You would hope it would be going into the firmware and, and you know, the software interface and everything else. But as we've seen, out of the box, it, you know, was not a good experience at all. It was pretty much a, a you know, lots of features missing, fail, didn't work properly. And that was just mucking around out of the box, let alone a detailed, uh, you know, a performance review of this thing. I mean, there is a lot of stuff on here, probably more than your average low-end scope in terms of, you know, your $400 scope in terms of uh, bomb parts, but nothing that justifies the price tag of this thing, really. So they're really, you know, you're paying for the specs, and I'm not sure how much they had 15, 20 ADCs are, but so without de doing a detailed bomb cost analysis, it you know, it looks like it should cost about half what it does. So I think they're charging a premium for that 14-bit ADC, and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, you know, as long as uh, it's, you know, everything's there and the battery option and all that sort of stuff, you know. Um, but, like, because there's not much on the else on the market, if anything, on the market like it. So I guess they can figure they can uh, charge a premium for it. But, and... I think they're justified in doing so if it's a, you know, a good, solid, capable scope. And the hardware is okay, but the thermal design of it's pretty poor. Just the way it was all assembled was a little bit how you do, and it wasn't nearly as, as spit and polished as other uh, scopes that we've seen teardowns of. So not hugely impressed by it, really. I mean, it's it's... I mean, it's not slapped together, it's not junk, but yeah, nothing really uh, makes me want to write home about it. Right, will it boot? Come on. Yes! Winner, winner, chicken dinner. And the touchscreen works, no worries. So there you have it, that's the 01 XDS 3202A, and as you've seen in my uh, unboxing video, like first impressions, not good, lots of firmware issues and other usability uh, issues, and I, as I said, I don't see where the, where the value is in this in terms of actual, you know, component and build cost for the uh, $1,200, apart from those ADCs, the 14-bit ADCs, and granted, the performance of it does look quite good if you're after a 14-bit ADC. In fact, there might be nothing else on the market like it um, anywhere near this sort of price point, but yeah, I like, it's nothing spectacular. Like in 8-bit, it's 1 gig sample per second, 200 megahertz uh, bandwidth, it, you know, it and there's no mixed signal capability. Uh, the ARB gen looks like it's got a fair bit of hardware in it, but you know, when it's touch screen, yeah, it might have Wi Fi and an app, which I haven't tried, but I like all wanky stuff, really. Anyway, eh, not going to write home about it, but there you go. Anyway, as always with these teardowns, I hope you learned something and you found it interesting. If you did, please give it a big thumbs up. Catch you next time. Oh, as always. High-res photo, teardown photos of this available on eevblog.com, linked down below. Catch you next time.